In today's episode of Shake the Table, we are joined by the one and only fantastic Davina McCool. Davina is one of the nation's most successful TV broadcasters with hit series, Long Lost Family, The Masked Singer, My Mum, Your Dad, which I love, and the groundbreaking documentaries Sex, Myths and the Menopause and Sex, Mind and the Menopause, the most recent in a long list of hugely successful programming. A subject close to my heart too, being a perimenopause a midlife woman. I think it's brilliant that Davina is using her platform in this way. In addition to her TV work, Davina's built a hugely successful fitness empire, encompassing no less than 15 fitness DVD releases and a range of equipment and her own fitness platform, Own Your Own Goals. Now, I just want to say we have a little gym room in our house that's just been done and I made my husband buy a DVD player because when I had my daughter 10 and a half years ago, I got very large. And the reason I lost my baby weight was your DVDs. And so I insisted that we go back to the original DVDs because I just loved them so much. And it was very hard to get a DVD player, but I was very... Yeah, it's quite hard, isn't it? Yes. Obviously, Davina's come and spoken to MNS colleagues before. Actually, we've obviously got a huge number of colleagues going through the menopause and perimenopause, obviously including myself. And it was an amazing session with, you know, very emotional moments and brilliantly led by you just with such passion and openness and honesty. So just it's fantastic to have you on the podcast. Not everyone's been wonderful, but just on a personal basis, very, very exciting. So we always start with a question. You've got lots of examples of this, I know. When did you feel as a woman, I've just got to shake the table here and kind of go for it? Do you know, I think I was really, really lucky to get into mainstream television at a time when there were loads of us all shaking the table like mad. So there was me, Claudia Winkleman, Zoe Ball, Sarah Cox. We were all kind of coming in at the same time. And TV was predominantly full of kind of male entertainers. Uh, Des O'Connor, Bruce Forsyth, like they were all kind of old school comedians, Les Dawson. And Scylla Black was kind of like the shining star that she was like a big role model, but it, you know, she had an amazing career as a singer and there all, we all were just gobby women, not embarrassed, not afraid, not shy, kind of different breed of woman. I got called a ladette, but I always thought it was quite funny because I felt like a ladette had to drink alcohol and I was, I was a sober ladette. And so I, I found that time in my career, because all these other brilliant women were all doing the same thing as me, we came at it like a tidal wave. I never really experienced sexism in television. I felt like I could do, I could do any job that a man could do if it was within my kind of talent. So I've been lucky in that. I think the place where I have got really angry is women's health. When I started looking into what was happening to me. And I had no idea. I'd never heard of the word perimenopause or I just thought that menopause was something that happened to women in their fifties. I wasn't ready at all to be classed as anything to do with menopause. I felt like when I got, when I got to perimenopause and I found this out and I thought, why did I not know about this? So I started kind of scratching the surface and I realized most GPs also seemed to not really be aware of what to do about it. It was something that we were historically told, look, it's just something that happens to you, just suck it up and get on with it. And I thought, hang on a minute, I'm absolutely going mad here. I feel like I want to leave my job. I don't feel like I can cope anymore. I've not got any joy in my life. I'm flatlining. I can't remember anything. I feel like I've got Alzheimer's. There must be more to life than this, this can't be happening. So I did some research and I found some brilliant people who were beginning to realize there was a problem here and that they were going to break the mold, look into it, learn about it and spread the news. So I set about trying to amplify them. Anybody that knew anything about perimenopause and menopause that I didn't know, I tried to talk to. But I just got angrier and angrier. I thought, why am I doing this? Why, why is an entertainment, lightweight entertainment TV presenter having to educate people? Why do we not all learn about this? Why do GPs, why GPs? And it's not GPs' fault. They're not given an option to learn about it. You know, like maybe 50% of universities teach 
menopause and perimenopause at med school. When you think about it, 100% of the women that are at their surgery will go through perimenopause and menopause and they don't know about it. That's disgusting. And that's not their fault. It's like they should be taught about it. It should be a, um, a module in, in their learning, whether they like it or not. It shouldn't be a speciality. What? So there were so many things. And I, I'm not an activist. I always call myself an, an accidental activist because I'm a very neutral person. I'm quite passive. I'm often taking the kind of central opinion. And it's not that I'm just a sit on the fence type person. I have opinions, but normally they're quite middle of the road opinions. I'm always open to having my mind swayed, my opinion changed. I'm always going to learn something new. And I'm having to do that in the menopause sphere all the time. But this was something that enraged me in a way like I've never been enraged before. I just thought, why, why are we not doing research? Why is the money not being spent? And how much money this would save the National Health Service if we weren't having to go back to the GP's office four times to get a proper diagnosis? Anyway, you can tell I was quite annoyed. Well, you gave a voice to Ooh. so many women, you know, who were suffering in silence and you've now enabled them to be able to open up those conversations amongst their friends and in their homes and in their doctor's surgeries um, and also, you know, busted a lot of myths around HRT as well, brought that into the mainstream. This is, it was such a huge shake the table moment and I love what, listening to your Instagram lives where you always learn about different aspects from the experts as well. So that's a brilliant shake the table moment. But let's go right back to the beginning of your career. And obviously, you've um, had an enviable career on lots of different platforms, not to mention also as a best selling author of your book, Menopausing. But how did it all begin? So, your first TV job, I think, was at MTV, if I'm correct. How did you get that role? So, for somebody look, who sees your career and wants to start off, what would you suggest and how did it begin for you? I was. I was working at Models One. I loved the job. I knew it wasn't going to be my job for the rest of my life. And through, it's such a weird round, the, you know, a roundabout way of getting a job in telly. But through that job, I ended up promoting nightclubs. And because I was promoting nightclubs, when MTV Europe launched, they wanted some quite extrovert people to entertain the pop stars and rock stars on the way to Amsterdam for the MTV Europe launch party. They asked me and some friends to do it. So I jumped at the chance and I dressed up as a, a sort of um, Hilda Robden style cleaning lady with a hairnet and lipstick on my teeth and support tights and an apron. And I had a tea urn full of um, champagne oh. going up down the carriages from Those Victoria. days just don't exist anymore, do they? Those kind of crazy parties. <laughs> and I, I went to Amsterdam and by the time I got to Amsterdam, I was like... I have to work for this company. <laughs> and that was that. Simple as that. I got someone's telephone number that night and I harassed them for about a year and then they said, please stop calling me. And I sent them VHSs of myself sort of presenting rubbish. And then I said, look, if I can't call you anymore, you have to give me someone else's number. So they gave me someone else's number and that person two years later gave me a job. That shows real determination, doesn't it? Because I found the thing mm. I really, really wanted to do, and it was worth never giving up on. And also, I could see myself doing it. I was like, I know I'd be good at this. I just had to make other people see it. But the, the random thing is, is that I mispronounced uh, someone's name on a, ca on a board outside a cafe that said, who'd eaten here? And it was a Japanese sumo wrestler and I couldn't say his name. And I was in, a, I couldn't kind of start pronouncing his name. And then, so I just sort of said it how I thought. And I just turned around to the camera and kind of did a look like that. And the guy that was watching thought it was so funny that that's why I got the job. It was so random and so nearly didn't get it that you just think, well, there you go. And if I hadn't got that, I would have kept trying. I knew I had to work there and I was quite prepared to start working in the kitchen. MTV was the type of company where we had people in the kitchen who were di directing a show the week later. If you wanted to get somewhere, all you had to do was get inside the door and you could say, can I try being a production assistant? And somebody would go, yeah, you're going to Frankfurt next week. It was like mad. But 
brilliant. I worked. It was my first job was when it? I graduated in a different kind of role. Yeah. And I think that's absolutely true. I mean, I thought it was wonderful. It was completely nuts. I mean, it was so mad, but an amazing place and also an amazing time. I mean, I was trying to tell my stepkids that there were tellies on the wall, like square ones that had backs to, and that that was a really cool thing at the time. I could see they're looking at me like, what the hell are you talking about? But I think it definitely had such an energy and you did just find people. And I think as well, and you all know this, if you were competent, it was like, this is amazing. You can actually do something because there were so many create, like it was like organized chaos. So actually when you talk about, oh, you know, these things just happen clearly though, very focused and very determined in your own way. And that is an amazing thing. I mean, I guess I am determined and focused, but I, what I, what I am always aware of is that I'm also just maybe more tenacious and creative than someone else who's got just as much talent as me, but I just didn't give up. How did you feel? How did you manage sort of your confidence level? So like when you tell this story now, and obviously like you're Davina McCall, but actually when you were like there, you know, younger starting out, how did you keep that tenacity up and did your confidence ever waver? I mean, actually, what's interesting is sometimes when I talk to friends of mine at school, from school, from when I was kind of 14 plus, they'd go, oh, my God, you were like so trendy. And I used to think, God, really? Because the way that I remember myself at school was absolutely frightened, tiny little person in here masquerading in cowboy hat and cowboy, you know, trying to be something, but not feeling it but I think what I realized quite quickly and quite young was that if I faked being confident eventually I would feel confident so if I faked it for long enough I'd go well actually I have settled into this party and actually I've had quite a few funny chats with people oh I feel better but you'd arrive like oh my god look I don't know anyone here I you know I just want to leave and you think on, just pretend, pretend. And, you know, fake it to make it so overused now. And um, if I was to say that to, them, to my kids, they'd probably roll their eyes at me. It bloody works. Sort of that idea that we're all winging it, aren't we? Nobody actually has got it all worked out. And I really don't believe them if they say that they have or give you that impression. We're all winging it to an extent. Do you still feel like that in your career? Mm -hmm. I mean, what's quite nice, I think, about getting older, and um, there are many merits to getting older, and I didn't really believe that when I was in my early 40s. I was really determined that I didn't ever want to get older, and I think that's why the perimenopause um, felt like such a burden to me at the beginning. But I bloody love it now because I, I do feel so much more confident genuinely, and I'm not having to fake it so much. Sometimes I still do, but nowhere near as much as I had to up until my early 40s, you know. But I would say that going through the menopause is as big a learning process as me getting clean from drinking drugs. And like it, it was like relearning everything I thought I knew about myself, shaking it all up and being a lot more accepting of the aging process in some ways and in other ways saying actually this bit I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go with and did you you talked earlier and I've written it down about becoming an accidental activist because I think that's a brilliant phrase did you feel like almost scared at doing did that feel like a new part of you that was almost a bit scary or did that feel natural no it didn't feel natural at all because I, like I said, I'm generally quite a kind of moderate person, but I didn't feel moderate about this. I thought, hang on a minute. We've been kind of, you know, told to just put up with everything all our lives. I, just, I can't tell you how many friends of mine had endometriosis, but were just told to, it's just your periods, just put up with it. No, they were in absolute agony every month. You know, it affected their chances of getting pregnant. You know, it's just like so many things. They weren't diagnosed until they were in their like, mid-30s because nobody listened. And this kind of stuff, it's not acceptable. And I never, I don't want to be the person that says it happened to men. 
something will be done about it because I believe that a lot of men, you know, also feel very angry about what's happened. So I don't want to kind of cast this thing, but in the same breath, it's not all right that we are not educated and we're not aware and we're not supported because we have far more complicated reproductive um, organs and wombs and uteruses and ovaries and cervixes. And there's so much going on with us. Nobody's kind of looked at or helping us with it. But that, I hope, is changing. This is something that I, I wasn't comfortable with. Um, but, you know, going to Parliament and um, when we went to go and get prescription um, charges changed to, to yearly with Make Menopause Matter as well. Um, and then from that, the menopause mandate being set up and kind of us being more of a lobbying group to, to support these kind of changes that need to be made. It felt so natural, really, in the end, because I was like, no, this is, this is wrong and we need to be loud and bolshy about it. And the one thing that I am good at is amplifying, you know. Well, you've got a platform and you know how to use it for good. Yes. And I you... think you're right. That is one of the benefits of being a feisty midlife woman not afraid to tackle these sort of troubling truths in women's lives but you must feel the same way right oh absolutely I mean for me it was staggering as well I didn't know this about my body for so long and I was involved in the menopause campaign that we ran with well-being of women the menopause workplace pledge which M&S have signed up to you know encouraging I think we've got over three and a half thousand now UK companies signed up to recognize this time in a woman's life and it seems beyond belief that that didn't exist before. There was no framework. And obviously in the workplace is a place where lots of those symptoms really become prohibitive. And the stats are shocking, the number of midlife women leaving the workforce. I mean, I think it's brilliant that you do give us this hope that there is a hope for a more equitable society for women. Have you got anything else under your sort of very chic black jacket um, about to come out for your next investigation? I mean, you've looked into the pill as well. There was a documentary on that. What's next, Davina? <laughs> well, I'm actually writing a book about birth because... I had three brilliant births and um, I've always wanted to do uh, a book about birth, but nobody really wanted to do it with me. But now I've got this new hat that I'm wearing. I've stayed in contact with lots of midwives and I did quite a lot of work for um, the NCT and did quite a few talks um, for midwives. I think midwives are like the greatest unsung heroes. They're so understaffed, underfunded, unappreciated. But they literally can change a woman's whole experience of giving birth, which in turn has a positive effect on her baby and their relationship has an effect on humankind, you know. So I've been hearing more and more that Britain's going a little bit more like America in terms of giving birth and medicalization of it. And this is going to be a book a bit like Menopause, in which is like a Bible of lots and lots of different women's experiences. The best experts I could find, I'm working with this amazing midwife called Midwife Marley. Again, like menopausing, loads of Instagram accounts in the back of people to follow if you're, if you're pregnant or thinking about having a baby. To empower us during a time when we feel quite disempowered, where you don't know the facts and you do anything that anybody tells you to keep your baby safe, which makes you kind of vulnerable to being swayed in one way or another. So it's the facts, because if you want to have a cesarean, I want you to have the best, the best cesarean that you can. If you want to have an epidural and lie down and read a magazine while you're giving birth, I want you to have the greatest version of that. So I want you to know everything there is to know and read every angle, every experience, different experience that women can, can go through having that kind of birth and weigh everything up yourself. Wow, I'm nodding in my head furiously at that yeah having had a very horrible difficult was it traumatic birth. yeah it was very traumatic I still can't really listen London grammar wow. were big at the time and I cannot listen to this London wow. grammar song still because it brings back that trauma and like a lot of your work Davina it's all about giving women that ability to advocate for themselves I wish I could have better advocated for myself during that first birth and I it was very different the second time around. 
because I felt much more in control. I mean, I did actually elect for a C-section the second time because I needed a controlled environment because it was totally out of my control and ended up being an emergency C-section and a very long time on that labor ward, 36 hours and a very big baby later. And I wish that I had been better able to advocate for myself earlier on in that journey. So this book is going to help so many others. And I feel know. like... I feel like- you know, what, what is also really important is that if you have a cesarean, don't ever shame a woman for having a different kind of birth from the one you had. Don't ever assume that you know why somebody would have gone for the birth that they had. There may be some really bit of, and it's the same with, it's the same with menopause. Don't shame somebody for being on HRT if you don't want to take it. Don't shame someone for not wanting to take it if you take it. We've got enough like trouble in our hands being a woman like the lead last thing we need is other women picking on each other because they're not doing what they did you know how do you balance because i think when you talk even in this kind of short chat that we're having it's a level of emotional support i feel like you get almost to me and rosie now but also like your sense of trying to help women it feels more an emotionally engaged perspective rather than just a kind of more detached, well, I just campaigned for this. How do you sort of manage your own almost energy levels and boundaries? Because I know even when we did the event for our colleagues at MS, you know, people do cry when you speak. There's a sort of very emotional connection. You know, people feel they know you. I mean, what did I say? I've asked for a DVD player because I like, look, at you know, you remind me of how I got fit after having my baby. You know, but it feels... People feel they know you and a connection. And when you start becoming a campaigner, that almost becomes an even deeper relationship rather than just, do oh, I love her on the telly? She's good fun, you know. How how do you manage that? Because it must sometimes feel exhausting. I don't know, maybe it doesn't. I am a really extrovert person. So I genuinely like talking to people. I take the tube. I often have quite fun, engaging conversations on the tube. I never think oh God, please don't talk to me. I'm always up for a chat. If I'm not up for a chat, I generally don't go out. I wouldn't be going on the tube and stuff. And if I wasn't in a kind of good place, I'm always happy. I'm listening to music. I sleep well. I eat well. I exercise. All of these things give me energy. They give me um, focus. But I also spend a lot of time, you know, snuggled up, watching television, um, relaxing spend lots of time with my family and when I engage I'm like fully engaged and loving it I mean people do know me I, you know it's, I've been on the telly for 32 years and people know me quite well and I've been through all my babies I've practically given birth on telly three times I've talked about almost everything I literally like can't kind of keep any secrets to myself which is hilarious so people do know me so but what I've got to now is a level where I, I feel like part of the furniture and it's a really nice feeling. It's less intense than when I was on Big Brother, which is a good thing. And so I'm not, I didn't take the tube for a long time. And about seven or eight years ago, I started taking the tube again. And I was like, oh, it's okay now. And I either get a nod and a smile or people want to talk to me, which is great. Or if I go to the supermarket, I get like a, a wink and a thank you or something from a lady passing by. Um, and I like that. It's nice. Well, you have been very honest about your life and you are a national treasure. I think Dame Davina has a very nice ring to it as well. well um, but I was very moved by an interview you did on Stephen Bartlett's Di Diary of a CEO, oh, yeah. where you talked at length, that had me in tears actually, about losing your beloved sister, Caroline, a number of years ago now. But you talked about creating a bucket list. And that being such a wonderful thing to do with the people that you really love in your life and those amazing sort of last few weeks, well, very difficult last few weeks that you had with Caroline, but also the kind of bonding of your relationship. What things are on your bucket list? Do you know what's funny is that, I, I mean, you know, in your second phase of life um, and having been with two of my favourite people as they died, I think it's made me really think about my death and what that will look like and how I will feel and how having seen my sister get ill and then die very quickly, I know that that can happen. 
So I thought a lot about what do I want to do? Like, who do I want to be? And I feel like I'm living it. Like I don't, there's not any kind of big fun things I feel like I want to do. I've done so many great things through my work. You know, I've swum with dolphins. I've swum with sperm whales. I've free dived. I've run with cheetahs. I mean, it's been ridiculous in my life. I played a zombie in a drama. You know, what I didn't realize I wanted to play a zombie sometime in my life until I played a zombie. Bucket list. Amazing. I love that. It was called Dead Set. And it was um, a Charlie Brooker drama about a zombie. And I, I basically turned into, I got eaten by a zombie and then turned into one. It was fantastic. You know, there's things like that that I've done that I didn't even know that I wanted to do. And I've, I tell my family a lot and the people that I love a lot that I am really happy. And I have lived a very brilliant life. To do more helpful things. And use my platform to help, I think, is probably it. It's given me purpose, really. I feel that's the sort of perfect place to end. And also what I think comes across is your very innate and deep happiness, which actually means you can give it quite freely. It's amazing. You're very calming to talk to, Davina, and very, very warm. And you do, inc- I'm not surprised that people talk to you on the tube all of the time because you have got that kind of talk to me. There's something about you that's a little bit magic. Um, and not everybody has that. So it really is a wonderful gift and just so amazing to see you using it for such good. Thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed it.